Martin, and welcome to uh, a quick chat that we're going to have here. Uh, I'm Kroll. I'll be leading this conversation. I'm joined here by Sabina from Mind. Uh, I'll let her introduce herself in just a moment. Uh, also joining me here are certainly someone here, Tricro and Tiny Tim. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we are going to have a discussion about mental health, about our charity, about what they do. And we just wanted to have a conversation about uh, one way that we can talk about mental health. Uh, we're going to do that through some statements uh, and kind of just see where the conversation leads. Uh, we've already been talking quite a bit behind the scenes and uh, we've already had some quite intense conversations today. So I think this is uh, a great place for us to start. Uh, before I do though, Sabina, if you could uh, quickly introduce everybody here to what Mind is and what you guys do. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, thank you for having uh, us, for having the Mind organization. Uh, Mind is a foundation in the Netherlands, and we strive, our mission actually is a, a mentally healthy society. So we want everybody who is struggling with whatever mental health issue to be able to get proper help and uh, understanding. We want a society where, in which um, we are there for one another. So no matter who you are, no matter what mental issues or emotions or thoughts you're struggling with and whether they are curable so to speak uh, like for instance a depression you can get out of that or whether it's something that you're more or less born with and have to learn to live with that that doesn't matter we want everybody to have more of an understanding of what dif different uh, mental health issues um, are about and what the effect is on the people who have them and the impact on the people around these uh, people. Because in the end, mental health uh, problems uh, aff affect us all. If I maybe um, uh, give a very short uh, anecdote about myself, um, I don't have mental health issues now. I have struggled with some eating disorders in the past. And I grew up with a mother who was... Uh, psychotic and a father who had depression de depression uh, uh, episodes so this had a huge impact on my personal life and it took me a long time to learn how to deal with that and it made me feel very lonely and that's one of the things that mind uh, our foundation wants to change we won't we don't want to we don't want people to feel lonely when they're struggling um, or even if their parents or partners or neighbors or friends are struggling, we want people to feel connected and feel that they're um, comfortable speaking of whatever is troubling them. Thank you. And I, I, I do actually want to uh, use this opportunity now that we've talked about uh, story. Uh, I know some of you have also had some stories to share. Is any of you willing to do that here on stream? I, it's a tough question, I know. Yeah, go on, go on. I, have, I was sharing my story before uh, we, we started. And I just wanted to... to I'll, quick, I'll try and keep it quick. But basically, uh, I am part of the speedrunning community purely because uh, a few years ago I, I was ill. Uh, and I've actually said this before on stream. I said it in the finale of Limit Break. But uh, I was obsessed with work. And I love my job. I really do. But it was becoming obsessive. And it reached the stage where I was basically burning out and I was very depressed. I was very ill and I was uh, ill for about eight weeks. But it, And it took a long time. I was in the way I like to describe it as I was, I was in a hole and I couldn't get out. And I but I managed to get out with the support of my friends and family, with counselling, with medication, which I'm still on. And I'm very proud of that because it's working for me. I think it's very important to keep that in mind. Medication is not necessarily a bad thing if it works, if it works for you, if it helps you. Uh, the, the, the phrase I like to use is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's not broke for me now. I'm a lot more comfortable, a lot better. But it was through that that I got into speed running. And I was able to attend a event in Glasgow in the UK uh, for the first time in 2019, not long after I was ill. And that year, I went to about eight different running events throughout the world. I went to America for the first time, left the country the first time as an adult. Uh, and I went to Sweden and I came here to the Netherlands. Uh, and it is, it's been fantastic. And 
yes, it, it was a bad experience, but I was able to overcome that. I was able to get out of the hole. And uh, one of the things the doctor said to me not long afterwards, he said, well, I explained everything. And I said, I'm feeling a lot better now. He said, well, you've done that yourself because you've believed in yourself and you've, you've, you've basically made yourself better. And also probably because you were able to ask for help. This is something that a lot of people have a difficult time with. Yes. They're scared or afraid or ashamed um, mm -hmm. to admit even to themselves that they have a problem. So this is something that our foundation really strives to um, uh, change, really. Yeah, by, by we organize, uh, we have the Mind Young Academy where we give... Um, young uh, people with experience with depression mm. under the age of 25, the opportunity to share their life story in school, in class. So the students realize that, first of all, they're not the only ones yes. struggling. Exactly. And that it's important to talk about it and, and that there are people there willing to help you. So I wonder, were you yourself, were you uh, afraid to uh, ask for help? No, uh, I was basically in a position where I had to uh, because uh, the, the, the circumstance was basically I was I was very close to a, uh, if not on a mental breakdown. And it was very, very obvious that I, I needed help. And it wasn't really a case of feeling that I couldn't go for help. It's that basically I had to. Uh, and especially with work, but work were very, very good. Uh, they immediately, uh, they, they had, they paid for all the counselling they had their own counselling service and they were like, right, we want you to get better. And they put a plan in place, uh, a phased return to work, et cetera, et cetera. And it was through the support of my work as well. Everybody played their part. And it was the doctors and my family and friends and my, my, my work that, that helped get me back. And what I like from that is that I went, it took me a while once I went back to work, but once I got better, I feel that I was even better. I always enjoyed my job and I felt I was good at my job, but I was much more confident going back and I was able to to really really get into it and also maintain a balance the work wasn't quite as obsessive I wasn't quite as obsessive about work I, I, think, was, I think your story is a great example of uh, or proof that it's possible to um, to, to you know to, to uh, recover from depression uh, if I may be so um, maybe rude but uh, I'm actually really interested in the, the um, statements you have because yes, uh, yes, we're here in a community of, uh, of, of, <laughs> yes. of gamers and um, um, there may be some prejudice about uh, gamers and addiction. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I was gonna gonna move into that because uh, one of the things we do a lot as BSG is we are in many ways a gaming community. And gaming does have a lot of prejudice to it. Um, and I just want to talk about your guys' perspective on gaming and gaming addiction. And I actually want to start off with just that, uh, whether you think gaming is addicting and why. Well, I think a lot of games are, can just be designed to be addictive. They want your attention. They want you to come back. They want you to play again. There's a positive feedback loop of... Uh, in a game, you can uh, defeat an enemy, and that's good. I get stuff. I like having stuff. I want to play again. I defeat another enemy. And that can really um, encourage that positive feedback loop and get someone addicted. So, yes, video games can be addictive in by purely design. Um, but, of course, there is always a checkpoint you can stop at. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to stop at. Like to All right, <laughs> Mike, uh, confusion aside, yeah, um, to build on what Tricro uh, said, uh, indeed a lot of games do happen to be addictive by design. Uh, but, well, now we start getting into what really is an addiction, and uh, I believe that something really becomes an addiction when it negatively starts affecting your daily life. And uh, despite games having this kind of addictive uh, feedback loop to them, um, there's definitely a sort of border you have to cross before they actually become negative to your life. See, um, I happen to be diagnosed with officially game addiction, which is because about three or four years ago, I've, I had reached a point where I was gaming so much that it definitely started impacting my life to an extent where I really just needed to tone it down. Um, 
And this was kind of a wake-up call because I realized I didn't even start enjoying games anymore because I had just been playing them for the sake of playing, I suppose. Uh, and then my therapist actually asked me a really important question that uh, happened to be that were I to be suddenly able to just stop gaming entirely, uh, would I do so? And um, I realized in due part to such a thing as BHG that no, I wouldn't want to because there are definitely so many positive elements to gaming that I'd love to keep in my life. So yeah. So, so what what was the point for you where you thought or felt like this is this is too much? I, this is not fun anymore. Or this is when was it? When did it become an addiction for you? Mm, that's difficult to say, but I really do believe that one day I just really start to realize that I want to do something, and I just couldn't. I just really I want to play a game. But nothing felt fun anymore. And I had that mood for like a week onwards. And then only when I really, I just, I think it was, I spent a day with my mom. And that kind of got me out of it for a bit. And then I noticed that came back. And I, I, I opened up about that to my mom. And she kind of helped me through that as well. Which, as we discussed earlier, asking for help is a really critical skill. And... I, I will say never to underestimate how difficult asking for help it can be uh, because it's not easy, but doing it can really change your life. And it uh, did for me. I'm feeling a lot more comfortable than I was back then. Wonderful. Yeah. Yep. No, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. Uh, I think a balance is to be struck. Uh, with with gaming. Uh, I'll share a very little anecdote uh, that you'll probably find amusing. Uh, many, many years ago, I bought uh, a game, uh, and most people will have heard of it. It's called World of Warcraft. And I deliberately did not play that game for nearly a year because I was worried I was going to get addicted to it. And I deliberately didn't play it. And, of course, when I did finally play it, 13 years later, I'm still playing it. But... I've made sure that I keep it under control. I never play more than maybe a few hours a week. Uh, I've I've been lucky to find a community within that game that has been very accepting of, of me, and I've been again with them for 12, 13 years. Uh, so, and and again, everybody's very supportive. But it is it's definitely something not to be underestimated. It, it's definitely definitely a real uh, a real challenge uh, at times. Lovely that you find a community like that. Yeah, no, I've been very, very lucky uh, with my with my gaming communities, to be perfectly honest. May I ask a question about, because you said you were officially diagnosed with gaming addiction. Um, what uh, was the kind of treatment that helped you uh, get rid of the addiction or get well, out of it? It was kind of interesting because... Technically, the kind of treatment prescribed was cognitive behavior therapy. But uh, I have to say, it's not so much the therapy that helped me as the therapists themselves. Because um, the therapists themselves understood that there was a lot more intertwined with this feeling than just, oh, I want to get rid of gaming. They, uh, they essentially were a very understanding person, and they... Uh, they also noticed that, uh, because I'm neurodivergent, right, so they also noticed that there were a lot more things intertwined with why gaming actually is attractive to me and why I don't want to get rid of it. So they understood that gaming is also something fundamental in my life that I just wanted to tone down. And eventually that helped me kind of realize in due part, just by simple conversations, that there's just some steps I can take to help myself. And uh, it, it essentially came down to just coming there, revising what happened and how I could improve. And that just helped me a lot. I, I, th I think I have a, I'm sorry, I, mean, I, have, I have so many questions. I, I, I think that, Please go um, ahead. well, I used to be addicted to smoking. And for me, that was 
a part of the reason why I was addicted is well, it's because of what was built into the cigarettes, the addictive uh, 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 stuff. Nicotine, yeah. Nicotine, <laughs> exactly. And um, so there's uh, addictive stuff in games too that is built in. So that may make you addicted. But there's an another component too for me that was escapism because or procrastination, in fact, because I there were things I needed or wanted to do, but then I I kind of felt like. Yeah, um, you know what? I'll just have a coffee and smoke a cigarette and I'll do it after that. So that I did that and I, w I just started procrastinating things. Um, I guess that because I was scared of doing certain things or I was afraid to fail or, you know. So I was wondering, with your gaming addiction, did you also experience some kind of... Um, uh, um, need to escape or procrastinate things? There was definitely a part of it was escapism. Uh, but it, as I said, that was just one part of a larger story. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if people know this, but uh, something that's been discussed in the medical world for a few times is that uh, people with HEG and neurodivergent people in general are more susceptible to addictions because it plays on the uh, especially the impulses, like with HGHG, you're very uh, susceptible to impulses and wanting to, like, you're easily distracted, right? So something that satisfies that distraction easily is more attractive to go to, which in part kind of worsened the escapism that I originally had. Rikro, what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, specifically on escapism, uh, I find video games are very easy to fall into escapism just because there are so many amazing, uh, varied uh, worlds. You can find stories um, that, like, there's a reason why choose your own adventure books are cool because it's a story in a book, but you can choose how it goes. And that's exactly what a video game can do um, because there are so many amazing parts of video games uh, that like aren't always expressed if the stereotypical uh, I'm sitting behind my chair on my mouse, click, 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 type keyboard, type keyboard. But the thing I'm doing with typing my keyboard, I'm talking to um, that username in my guild in World of Warcraft because um, World of Warcraft is des by design meant to be a group of people coming together to, I don't know, do the late game content and enjoy that and that's what people fall into because uh, because it is so well made, it's hard not to at some times. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the very interesting things I experience here being your guest at the DSG uh, convention is that I've, I've I, the prejudice is that um, 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 well, a lot of people think of gamers as very lonely people that just sit behind their computer all day by themselves and that they have no friends or whatsoever. But like you um, pointed out, I, it, it seems like you have a lot of. Um, the sound okay? I th think uh, we're okay. all good. So there's a, there are a lot of. Um, um, uh, com uh, communities and contacts you actually have with with um, other gamers on the others on the other end of yeah, the this, uh, uh, this actually chance. gets us into the last little topic that I wanted to briefly talk about uh, before we uh, start finishing off here, uh, which is uh, whether gaming or not can be good for your social skills because that's something that has a lot of stereotypes to it, and I think it's worth discussing that briefly. Yes, you want to start, someone or no? You go ahead. Okay, no problem. Yes, I, I definitely agree. Uh, it's, it, has a, it is definitely a benefit. With, with a lot of the things we've discussed, there are pros and cons to everything. And the, as you've just mentioned, the, the sort of stereotypical sitting in your room uh, scenario uh, does happen. But one of the things I appreciate, especially about the speedrunning community, is as you mentioned, it allows me to have uh, friends and contacts all over the world. Uh, I'm so proud to be able to, to name practically Dozens of countries where I know people, and I've spoken to them online or in person, uh, a lot at some of these events, and it's it's absolutely fantastic. And it's another thing that I wouldn't have had uh, had I not been able to 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 join the speedrunning community and be more confident 
to be able to do that. Because before but I but was ill... But would you also think that your s offline social skills are improved by... Yes. Yeah? Okay, definitely, that's cool. Definitely. <laughs> uh, I definitely feel that... that I mean, obviously, I, my job is I speak, to people for, I speak to people for a living. I teach. But I love... And I love to do that. But it definitely has helped having an interaction. One of the things I find fascinating is speaking to people from different cultures and different countries and in different languages. Uh, it makes me feel very, very ashamed of my own language, lack of language skills, uh, because I'm so surrounded by people who are so multilingual, and it's just, it's, it's fantastic. It's inspiring uh, for me, for me personally. I could just briefly go one more point. Um, in terms of being social together and feeling comfortable to be social together, um, a lot of games, puzzles that we can be playing um, can just mean. We're both playing together. I'm doing my little puzzle. You're doing your little puzzle. And we're together, but we don't have to always socially interact like that. And that's really, really nice for someone who can't always put the words together, someone who um, might not feel comfortable constantly being like, hey, we're having a conversation. Um, but we can be t in a group. Still be social, yeah, but, be but in a different way, I guess. Without the pressures of constantly being uh, talking, and uh, we can play a game together, and uh, the occasional, oh, you did very well. Or a very interesting point. I never thought of that. Yeah, which is a very common thing in board games. But I'll lend. I'll end my talk there. Feel free. No, that's actually <laughs> a lovely point you're making because, um, well, the funny thing is that. Uh, the the funny thing is that like uh, my game addiction it technically was classified as game addiction but a big part of it was actually also being ad addicted to stuff like social media and such and uh, what I've actually noticed it's that since I ended that therapy I've actually been I've been playing a lot less actual games but I've been talking to people more and that's actually the balance I prefer because a lot of what I actually gain from games is genuine connections with people I've. I've made so many great friendships, like uh, all these people surrounding me right now. Um, I got a little emotional earlier just now in the practice room, and uh, I was immediately supported, uh, surrounded by people who support me. And it's just such a great feeling. And I think this is just something special I would have never had without gaming. So, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I was actually there, and I, I uh, so I was witness to that, and uh, I, I, I can really appreciate and understand a little bit more now. So thank you very much for inviting me to, to this event. It's really wonderful to have this conversation. I, I would love to continue this conversation for for uh, hours, or <laughs> but uh, because yeah. I, I think there's a lot of statements the, the we haven't discussed yet. But there's uh, a lot we haven't discussed, but at the same time, I think we are uh, going to have to start rounding up soon because I believe we are uh, closing in on our time. Um, I hope it's been enlightening in many ways to to talk about gaming in a bit of a different perspective, but also to just have a conversation about mental health and about what that means to us. Uh, I definitely want to encourage everybody watching at home to to reach out to a friend, talk to people, talk, get in touch with others, uh, talk about what you're what you're going through, or maybe also share your own opinions and uh, thoughts about what we've discussed. Uh, I'd be very interested, really, um, because well, as I uh, said before, uh, the Mind Foundation tries to um, our mission is a mentally healthy society, and uh, I think understanding one another better is a crucial part of that. So please uh, feel free to share. I'd be very interested. If you want to find more information on the Mind Foundation, we've got a charity command in chat that you can check out. Yeah, and in general, if you if you have things to share, things you want to talk about uh, in the chat, I don't know if we have anything that may have popped up over the course of our conversation, but you know, reach out to each other and talk with each other. One last thing, if I may be saying. Yeah, so. of course, of course. Uh, um, if you live in the Netherlands and you have, uh, and you feel triggered because you uh, think, well, I actually do have some things I need help with, we have a, a free phone number with professional caregivers who can uh, listen to you, um, try to uh, figure out what help is uh, most appropriate for you. So you can call them. It's called uh, our. Uh, 
that division of mind is called mind correlation. Mind correlation. So you can call them for free at o uh, nine hundred one four five o. So please feel free to do that. It's free of charge, and they are most willing to help you figure out what you uh, need. Before we are going to close off, I quickly want to give a quick look at the host to see if he has anything he still wants to say at this point uh, before we round off. Before you round off, um, chat has actually gone off your discussion about the whole procrastination thing you know, and how to get over the hump there. Do you guys maybe have a short insight or maybe even a tip to the people that are starting to put off things to do and go play a game, etc., or anything to help you know, overcome this hump and actually get the thing done that they're actually supposed to do? Well, um, uh, in in my life, uh, it was I would be like as a child, I'd be procrastinating homework, of course. Um, but it would be after I do this one thing, I would do this, and it's just set shorter, smaller objectives for yourself. Uh, that's just myself. But, uh. Yes, I, I think that that's another thing that I personally have had a lot of experience with. Is, and I think everybody does. I think it's a common a common thread. Uh, but again, what Tricro was saying, the other thing I try and do is I just try and uh, regiment myself. I mean, obviously it doesn't work for everybody, but when I get up, I'm like, right, I've got to do this, 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 and this. And I follow a, a sort of process for it. Uh, I find that easier when your routine is obviously more structured. Sometimes when it's not, that becomes more difficult. But uh, yeah, it is it is it is definitely a challenge. But the way I deal with it personally is to try and just have a... And again, as Trico says, try not to think too far ahead. Just deal with what's in front of you as and when you can and then move on to the next uh, next task. To be to be quite frank, I still struggle with procrastination. Uh, and so it, it, I find that a very interesting topic myself. And I just listened to this uh, Blinkist app uh, where they have summaries of books. And this book was about procrastination. And they actually said, well, perfectionism or fear of failure is part of procrastination. So um, if you're able to realize that you're just human and that what you're doing or creating or uh, have to do does not have to be perfect, that kind of helps. And as you said, um, it's uh, good to to cut it up in chunks, small chunks, so it's, it's, it's a sizable bite that you can just do, you know, just do it in parts, not try to do the whole project or task all at once. Um, and be kind to yourself. <laughs> If I may butt in right there for just a second there, I think that is a thing that is specific to speedrunners in a way, because, you know, we've all been there, like, resetting just because, you know, you're all, like, five seconds behind your perfect split or something, you know. You're just not getting the actual run done in a way. You're just resetting the whole thing over and over again. And I think that is something that, you know, kind of plays into that whole discussion just a little bit. So, you know, so, you know guys, don't stop resetting for a moment, there, you know, just get the run done at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one thing to add to this discussion, and that's, uh, yeah, it, it might sound a bit controversial, but also give yourself time to actually procrastinate. Give yourself some time to actually rest. And I don't mean 15 minutes between two hour study breaks. I mean, give yourself half a day off sometimes if you can manage that. Uh, Absolutely agree with that. That's such good advice. I, I notice when I like start procrastinating, I just get burned out. So, yeah. Uh, I do understand that uh, I will procrastinate. It's not a case of uh, uh, trying not to. I will. So uh, just making it more controlled and uh, so yeah. feel free. Right. Uh, again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Sabina, for being oh, thank here. Thank you, guys. For, uh, it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, if you guys at home want to support the Mount... Mind <coughs> Sorry, Mind the Mind Foundation. Mind, Mind, Mind Foundation. Foundation. Uh, the donations are still going for the rest of the event. We got some amazing donation incentives. We got some amazing prizes. So you can win something in the process. Uh, all of our uh, the money donated is going to Mind, and it is just helping uh, many people who are struggling with it. Um, Actually, thanks to everybody who has donated and people who still want to donate. I ha I created a page on the, our um, Do May Participate with Mind uh, website. Uh, which I, um, how do you say that? 
fill in. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, it's in Dutch. But I'll make sure to make a translation so that, and I'll c I can send you the link, Rick. So, or um, what's your gamer name again? Oh. <laughs> it's, it's fine. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll send you the link uh, as soon as it's ready, so that you guys who have the, uh, all the people who have donated or are considering to donate can see what we actually do with your donations. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. With that, I'm uh, going to give it back to the crew. We have some amazing runs still scheduled for the day. Uh, I'll be back in a couple of hours from the hosting desk and uh, enjoy the last uh, day and a half of BSG.